Hello, dear ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second panel on this morning. I hope the coffee break was not too short, so you are rested and will stay with us. This panel will discuss the general data protection regulation and its relevance for banking supervision. As was mentioned by Chiara Ciglioli in her opening speech, the European Union is based on the rule of law and fundamental rights are at the heart, at the core of such a legal order. Fundamental rights must, within the applicable limits, be respected by all legal acts created within the legal framework of the Union. Legislative acts, like regulations, for example, must comply with them, as well as individual decisions. Data protection is a fundamental right enshrined in Article 8 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the Union. Consequently, also banking supervisors, including the CECD, must comply with the rules of data protection enshrined in the Charter. For national supervisors, the national legal system may even establish additional obligations. The data protection related obligations of, in particular, public authorities are further elaborated in two regulations. The first is Regulation 2016-679, more commonly known as the General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR. This regulation establishes the data protection framework applicable to organizations established in the EU, as well as to organizations based outside the EU that intentionally offer goods or services to the EU or monitor the behavior of individuals within the EU. The second regulation is Regulation 2018-1725, the so-called EU GPR. This regulation established the rules applicable to the processing of personal data by EU institutions, bodies, offices, and agencies, and is therefore applicable to the ECB. The rules of the EU GPR are similar, though not always identical, to the rules of the GDPR. However, whenever the provisions of the EU GPR follow the same principle as the GDPR, those two sets of provisions should, under the case law of the European Court, be interpreted homogeneously, in particular because the scheme of EU GPR should be understood as equivalent to the scheme of the GDPR. So, for our discussions, they are very close together, is the message. And this is said in Recital 5 of the EU EPR. A first dimension of the relationship between data protection and banking supervision is consequently how can banking supervisors ensure compliance with the obligations under the data protection rules. Such compliance may be sometimes raising practical issues. For example, if an on, in an on-site inspection, individual credit files shall be reviewed. And such compliance may also require adjustments to the processes applied. But, as we will hear, it is feasible. In this context, we will also see how divergent interests of the data subject, whose data are concerned, and the interests of supervisors, being controllers and processors in terms of the EU GPR, and GDPR are balanced by the law or have to be balanced in a concrete case. A second dimension in the relationship between data protection and banking supervision may not be as obvious. Banking supervisors are subject to confidentiality obligations. The prof professional secrecy regime is established as a counterpart to the broad obligation of supervised entities to pro provide information to supervisors. It requires banking supervisors to keep confidential, not publicly known data, whose disclosure is likely to adversely affect either the proper functioning of the system of, for banking supervision or the interest of the person who provided the information, the banks normally, or a third party. Therefore, the professional secrecy regime shall in particular protect the legitimate interests of the supervised entities and may as such be required by fundamental rights, like the freedom to conduct a business. The right enshrined in Article 16 of the Charter protects also commercial secrets against interference by, among others, banking supervisors. In the majority of situations, the obligations 
of supervisors to keep certain information confidential and the obligation under data protection rules coincide. However, there may also be cases where a data subject may invoke rights under the GDPR or EU DPR, which would require a supervisor not to comply with professional secrecy rules. This may, for example, be the case if an individual asks for access to personal data stored with the supervisor, which the supervisor received from an institution. In order to tackle these two dimensions, the presenters in this panel will first introduce the concepts of the EU DPR and the GDPR. Thereafter, the professional secrecy obligations of banking supervisors and potential conflicts with rights of data subjects will be discussed. This will finally be followed by a view on the issue how a banking supervisor can ensure compliance with the data protection rules and the challenges connected therewith, as well as on the role of the data protection officer in this context. The introduction in the basic principles and definition of the data protection regulation, as well as a discussion of the most relevant rights of the individuals under this legislation will be provided to us by Karolina Rosetchevic. Karolina is one of the persons best placed to do this. She was one of the commission's representatives in the interinstitutional negotiations with the parliament and the council and the DAO on the data, general data protection regulation and currently is deputy head of the unit responsible for data protection at the European Commission and therefore is involved in the implementation of these rules. Carolina previously served as a member of the European Commission's legal services, focusing on competition law and international trade law and represented the Commission in numerous cases before the European courts and DTO panel. Carolina, thank you that you are with us today in Brussels in the hybrid setting. Carolina's presentation will be followed by Sandrine Etocard. Sandrine is principal legal counsel in the supervisory law division of the ECB. She works at the ECB since 2005 in various roles, among them as secretary of the legal committee. Sandrine started her professional life in private practice at the Brussels Bar and held also positions as teaching assistant at different universities. The final presentation will be provided by Martin Daman, the data protection officer of the ECB and the European Systemic Risk Board. Before joining the ECB, he worked for the International Court of Justice, the European Police Office Europol, and is a genocide researcher in Rwanda. You see, we have a diverse background in this panel. Finally, before giving the floor to Carolina, let me say a few words in terms of housekeeping. The presentations will be presented in one go and the floor will be open for discussions immediately thereafter. Please raise therefore already during the presentations your hand for questions. Please do that so that you keep your questions perhaps also in the order. Use for this the hand raising function in WebEx. We will register this and grant the floor in the order of hands raised. In doing so, we will call you out and my colleagues administering the technical side, which I thank you here with very much, will provide you the floor. Please remember the, then to unmute yourself and turn on the camera. Unfortunately, it will take then a moment until you can speak. When asking your questions, you are invited to mention your name and function before posing, posing the question, please mention in your question also to whom it is addressed, if it's addressed to a specific panel member. Now, let me, without further delay, provide the floor to Carolina for our presentation that as a whole end then will be made available to the public via ECB's website. Carolina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope it will not uh, be disturbing in any event. Um, without any further ado, I would like to start uh, with the presentation. And uh, in, um, if we can move to the following slide, um, I would like to take you through the main objectives and major changes of something that it's not so new anymore and it's being applicable since 2018. So the 
why the change? Why the change from the Directive 95, from the previous uh, um, uh, uh, regulation, which was um, uh, regulating the processing of personal data by the European institutions? Because of the um, need to adjust um, data protection rules to the changes in the digital age. The use of personal data, processing of personal data, generation of uh, personal data uh, grew exponentially within um, the last years and our, um, our legal framework needed to be on one hand harmonized, on the other hand simplified. We had the problem concerning the directive of various implementations on the level of the member states, so that uh, um, in a situation with, where data was processed cross-border by big international companies, platforms, as we refer to them nowadays, we were in a situation where, uh, depending on the member states, um, uh, different entities would be assessed to be the controller. Uh, we will hear what it. Uh, who are the controllers different to be processors. There was also a different interpretation uh, bit of what is a personal data as such. So inducing, uh, harmonizing, simplifying, inducing flexibility, ensuring that our rules are technologically neutral, that we do not stop the technological um, development, but that we frame it bearing in mind as we heard in the in, in the introduction that uh, we are speaking here about fundamental right and not everything should be done and not everything should be allowed another element and one other uh, um, uh, consideration the the commission had tabling the proposal and then the two legislators, the Council and the Parliament, while preparing their positions on it, was to put the individuals more in control of what is going uh, on with their data. Here we have seen, you see, a big continuity between the rights uh, provided for in the directive and uh, then in the GDPR, in the Directive 95 and in the GDPR. There were, however, some clarifications, updates, and a new right of data portability added to it. What was, at, uh, what was guiding all the considerations and discussions in the Commission while adopting the proposal in the Council and in the Parliament is to ensure that an individual can decide um, or to the extent possible, because some legal some legal basis provide for, um, well, um, de facto cut down on, on possibility to decide. When I think I think here in particular, when the processing is provided for by law, but um, to the extent possible, make an individual aware of what is going with his or her data, how is it being used who takes advantage of it, what kind of consequences can be drawn from processing of data and making individuals more aware of the vast amount of data they um, generate while using various devices. Finally, I'm here at the point C, we realized that the um, in the new um, brave digital world, um, this division um, ag along the borders did not make sense, therefore the regulation, but also the need to have this one law being enforced in one way, to have one interpretation which we would be a speedier than just waiting uh, the final interpretation by the Court of Justice when it, the, uh, the enforcement was done only on the national level and um, and there was no other means of inducing consistency in uh, in the interpretation of the of the terms and rules provided for in the directive 95 so 
what was done is um, to establish the cooperation mechanism, the mechanism of uh, cooperation uh, um, between, um, indeed, thank you very much, I should have moved to, another, to the following slide. So the single set of rules um, regulation, I'm at point one interlocutor and one interpretation, one stop shop and consistency mechanism. One stop shop, the cooperation mechanism. What it provides for is that in all individual cases, in all um, cases concerning one complaint, one, uh, one a company, one controller, one undertaking who is undertaking the processing, there will be only one interlocutor, one data protection authority to which will be equipped with full powers, effective powers, um, pow effective powers concerning investigation and concerning uh, corrective measures. Uh, um, and, um, and that uh, all the other authorities um, will be cooperating with it, with this uh, authority, which will, uh, which is called the lead of the authority on the territory of which um, the controller or processor or processor have uh, uh, or has its main establishment. This matched with consistency mechanism. So this one-stop shop cooperation mechanism matched with consistency mechanism leads to unified interpretation of the data protection rules and application of those rules in individual cases before the whole litigation, should there be one, um, goes through the national courts and then ultimately through the court of justice. How does it work? Data protection authorities and which are concerned because they have um, data subjects where, uh, which are affected by a certain kind of processing or because they have to receive the complaint and the authority on which territory the controller or processors have their um, or processor have their, um, their main establishment will cooperate and agree on one interpretation of the regulation in this individual case. Should there be differences between them, there is, uh, um, there is a possibility to discuss it. If this possibility to discuss does not bear further fruits, and the authorities can move to the level of the board, European Data Protection Board, which gathers all the uh, national data protection authorities and EDPS and find their uh, resolution of the dispute. In such a case, um, European Data Protection Board will adopt a decision which will be addressed to the lead and concerned authorities providing for the interpretation of the regulation in this individual case. It's important to remember that this decision is addressed not to the undertakings, so not to the controller processor or the complainant should, the, should we uh, be in a situation of rejection of complaint, but to the authority, the lead and concerns authorities, which on the basis of that decision which will provide for the legal interpretation of the terms relevant in um, in uh, for for the resolution of this case and uh, the the lead authority and concerned authorities will have to take this interpretation and apply it to the facts of the case while adopting the final decision in this way, we created a, a, a uniform interpretation, and in order to um, to ensure that we have a level playing field, we ensured that the territorial scope of the regulation is such that whoever offers goods and services on the uh, um, on the uh, territory of the European Union and targets our citizens will have to apply the same laws. So here we will not be any longer in the situation where third country companies will not be subject to the to the laws applicable in the European Union. On the other hand, 
I'm at the last point, cutting red tape. Um, we cut down on notification, require our authorization requirements. We moved to something called accountability principle, where the controller needs to assess itself in the light of its obligations under the GDPR and, uh, um, and uh, will be required to uh, uh, contact uh, Data Protection Authority only in very specific cases. Here, I think in, uh, in particular uh, of the case of uh, residual risk uh, um, staying after Data Protection Impact Assessment was done. Let us move to the next um, uh, slide um, where um, um, I will um, um, address points which uh, uh, concern the scope of the application of the GDPR. Um, so, and I will uh, take you um, um, in more detail through, for example, and that the first point that the which uh, defines the application of the GDPR and UDPR, they are applicable only when we speak about personal data. In a situation, we will hear what is personal data, but in a situation, we there is no longer personal data, data is anonymized, the GDPR and EUDPR do not apply. Material scope of the GDPR, article to business operators, also public authorities, except when we speak about police um, law enforcement authorities to which a police directive, so-called led law enforcement directive is applicable. Processing for national security uh, purposes is also excluded from the application of GDPR because the EU law does not apply to it. But here I flag, and it's something very, uh, very much discussed nowadays in the light of all the Pegasus uh, uh, discussions, which are growing like uh, mushrooms in different member states. This cannot be a bogus national security claim coming from the member states. The jurisprudence of the Court of Justice is fairly clear on um, and the need to justify by the member state that it's a genuine national security uh, purpose which is being pursued and uh, invigilating journalists or uh, um, MEPs um, 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 a member of national and parliaments will very rarely qualify as such. The GDPR also does not apply uh, when the individuals uh, process personal data for purely personal household activities. It's an exception and as such it's to be interpreted in a very narrow way. Territorial scope, Article 3, I mentioned it already while discussing the previous slide when speaking about the level playing field, to which extent the GDPR applies also to um, third country undertakings which are uh, offering uh, good services on the European territory or are targeting our um, residents. The criteria for such a targeting is provided for in the uh, in the GDPR. And, and next slide, if I may. The difference, um, and Klaus mentioned it already um, very shortly, between the EU or the GDPR and EU DPR. Why the need for EU DPR? And if you may ask yourself, well, where GDPR apply to public sector also, um, why is there a need for the uh, European institutions, agencies and bodies to have a, a separate, um, separate uh, um, uh, regulation? Well, the specificities of our work and the fact that uh, um, that uh, this is, uh, that, that it's, uh, um, we are speaking here about public sector only. Uh, concerning the uh, um, the uh, interpretation and so uh, of the EU DPR, I'm referring in particular to Recital Five. Whenever there is an uh, uh, the provision of the EU DPR, follow the same principles of the GDPR, which is 
the issues concerning the the uh, transparency um rights um the provisions of the gd of the udpr uh, should be and those of the gdpr should be interpreted homogeneously um because the udpr is by no means to mean that uh, the european institutions agents in the european institutions agencies and bodies are subject to less strict control concerning the legality of processing of personal data okay let us move to the definitions the next slide um i will cover the most relevant for our uh, presentations today and our discussions today, the definitions of the personal data, what does it mean, what is the difference between pseudonymization and anonymization, which are very often uh, mixed together and to very often um, it's being misunderstood that uh, um, um, aggregation, um, even very high level aggregation, pseudonymization of data is sufficient in order to exclude the application of the GDPR or UDPR. I'll mention shortly categories of um, special categories of personal data, and I will devote more time to the definitions of controller processors and joint controllership. So what is personal data? Um, personal data is a data which includes information which allows uh, to identify um, um, or uh, any information actually which relates to an identified or identifiable living individual. Person, GDPR does not apply to deceased persons. It's up to the member states to, um, to uh, decide how the data of deceased person is to be protected. So different pieces of information which collected together can lead to identification of particular person, constitute personal data. And personal data, um, that has been um, um, and, um, de identified, encrypted, and pseudon pseudonymized can also lead to reidentification of the person, uh, which can lead to reidentification of the person, remains personal data and falls within the scope of the GDPR. This is um, 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 personal data um, um, is being protected regardless of the technology used for the processing of this data. Of this data. Uh, GDPR, as I mentioned before, is technologically neutral, applies to both automated and um, manual processing, provided that data is organized with a predefined criteria, for example, alphabetical order. It does not matter how the data is stored. Uh, so, for example, an IT system uh, through video surveillance or on paper, or in all these cases, the GDPR is, um, uh, is and the UDPR are um, applicable. In this uh, context, what constitutes really processing? It covers a wide range of, uh, of operations performed on personal data. Um, as you have already heard, being at manual, being uh, by automated means, collection, recording, organization, uh, structuring, uh, uh, alternation, uh, consultation, use, um, or otherwise making available. It's a very, very broad definition between this very broad notion of identified or identifiable and broad understanding of processing. It's um, it's very difficult to find, uh, so, and here I will move to pseudonymization versus anonymization to find data which will be um, a truly uh, non-personal when it in the beginning referred to an individual. To give you a flavor, uh, according to the Court of Justice, even dynamic IP addresses are being considered um, personal data. 
even the uh, very uh, um, aggregated and uh, very uh, secured uh, keys on our COVID apps are personal data. Therefore, and the application of our uh, COVID um, gateway and uh, the the uh, the codes which the member states were exchanging was protected under the data protection legislation. What is then the difference between pseudonymization and anonymization? Pseudonymization is um, a kind of safeguard. It reduces the uh, privacy um, risks because it um, provides, it encrypts um, the data and it more makes it more difficult uh, um, to somebody who, for example, does not possess the key to uh, identify individual. Nevertheless, it's still personal data because it can be attributed to an individual or um, a person um, uh, which has additional information and um, additional data set, which uh, two data sets match together will um, make um, this uh, from a data which a priori cannot uh, lead to an, an to an individual will um, be able to uh, to lead to an individual to identifiable person. Now it um, the the data can be rendered anonymous. It's uh, not um, uh, this in order. Uh, uh, for the data uh, to be anonym uh, anonymous, it must be truly anonymized in the sense of irreversible. Uh, you can already imagine it's a very difficult exercise, which is um, in the light of the recent, uh, recent technological developments, very difficult to achieve. On the other hand, the GDPR in particular does not provide for an absolute test. The measure is still the um, state of art knowledge and also the um, financial resources which would be necessary to deploy in order to um, re-identify, to render anonymous data again personal. So it's not an absolute test, but a test which is uh, which has there are some openings and um, uh, well, the, the, for example, this this notion and uh, the European Data Protection Board is discussing now guidelines concerning the anonymization techniques or the test for pseudonymization and anonymization. And indeed, the for example, the test of um, the um, um, the, the, the uh, costs um, which you see on your slide is not that of the financial capacities of an individual undertaking, but it's an objective one. Um, there exists, and I would like to move here to the next slide, a special category of data, so-called sensitive data, which are protected even more. This is a data uh, uh, which could create, which the disclosure and processing of which could create more significant uh, risks to the personal fundamental rights and freedoms by, for example, leading to an, uh, uh, discrimination on the grounds of uh, a sexual orientation, political views, or um, some, um, uh, or uh, because of health uh, status. And the processing of such a data, so whatever can be done with it, is subject to additional um, specific conditions which are, uh, are provided for in the GDPR in Article 9. This is an explicit consent, so a, a kind of consent which is even clearer than the consent which allows for the normal processing of personal data and an uh, array of situations which uh, uh, provide for this possibility. Um, a vast majority of them will need to be provided by law. For example, social security, um, uh, 
public interest or uh, some uh, legitimate activities of foundations, associations, and so on. Um, bearing in mind the time, I would like to move to the next slide, the uh, so interesting for us, um, L, the, the definitions of controllers, processors, the definition of joint controllership, and uh, uh, the, the rules under the GDPR and EU DPR, which uh, regulate the responsibility of these entities um, and the relationship between them. Who's a data controller? Data controller is a natural or legal person who determines the purposes for which it um, um, which uh, for which the data is uh, being uh, is being uh, uh, processed. Um, process um, it determines the purposes and means. The controller bears the main responsibility of the processing under the uh, EU DPR and GDPR. In the setting of uh, um, in the setting of uh, uh, um, uh, public administration, the um, the identity identification of the uh, controller will be made very often on the basis of the law. The law will provide who is the controller. In the case this is not done, it will be uh, it will be derived from the uh, from the tasks which the uh, entity has to fulfill, and uh, uh, yeah, and the responsibilities which will be attached to it. The processor is a person or an entity, a public or private body, which will be responsible. If we can go back to the slide on the um, exactly, which will be responsible for processing of data on behalf of the controller. The processing can be still uh, um, sub, um, pro, um, the processor can use still another processor to process personal data on its behalf, which is called a, a sub processor. Um, going back because now it will be to now to the control that on the next slide. Um, the controller's um, uh, uh, responsibilities or choices concerning the processor are subject to uh, the test of sufficient guarantees. Controller can only use, if it's not provided for by law, which processors are to be used, uh, uh, processors which provide sufficient guarantees. The controller has also all the interest to do so because and bottom line, the vast majority of the obligations um, under the GDPR and UDPR, even more because they're that's, uh, very often provided for by law, um, are um, attached to the controller and processor has very few obligations stemming directly from the legislation. And if something go goes wrong, it's the controller who will stand up for uh, the uh, for the uh, uh, compliance with G GDPR and will be liable for um, compliance with all the aspects of the GDPR and for demonstrating such uh, compliance. Joint controllership, which... I, uh, sorry, I apologize yeah? for jumping in here, Carolina, but in light of the time, I would suggest that we perhaps leave the joint controllership for the discussion, because I would guess there may be questions on that, and perhaps we continue... We just the, go uh, to the slides. To Perfect. ...to the rights, and uh, then, uh, because... Okay. Know, thanks. Perfect. The rights. Um, if we can go to the slide concerning the uh, rights. Um, rights which are provided for, I have here the article from the GDPR, the same applies to the UDPR, information access, rectification in Eurasia. The remaining ones are very rarely, if at all, used in the setting of public administration where the processing is provided for by law or attached to the task. Um, 
to the task uh, um, um, exercised by the um, um, by the uh, authority. Information. Um, the individuals have to receive the information on the name, purposes, categories of personal data process, legal basis of processing, length uh, um, uh, of the of the uh, how long the processing will take uh, will take place, uh, whether data will be transferred outside of the EU on the basic rights, right to lodge the complaint, right to should there be the processing taking place on the basis of consent, um, and the, the right to um, uh, uh, the, the information concerning the right to withdraw the consent. Uh, concerning um, uh, the, the access, um, the individuals have the right to ask and obtain from the organization a confirmation as uh, whether the they, they data is being processed, whether uh, this uh, entity holds any data uh, which concerns um, uh, individual. Um, the right to access of that data can be provided in the form of copy and uh, um, um, the individual uh, um, um, can have uh, access to all relevant additional information uh, uh, concerning the, the processing. Um, right of access should be easy and uh, generally free of um, charge. What happens if the data is uh, insecure, uh, in, in uh, correct, uh, uh, the data should not be insecure <laughs> um, when it's incorrect, incomplete or, in, uh, or inaccurate, individual can ask uh, the, the, the undertaking company organization to uh, correct such data uh, and uh, the, the controller uh, is obliged to do so without any due delay or justifying writing why it's not done. Um, and the last one I would like to mention here is the um, is the uh, right of uh, uh, erasure. Um, one can uh, ask uh, deletion of personal data when this data is no longer needed or where it has been used uh, unlawfully. Uh, in the setting of banking supervision, it will be very it, it, it will be um, regulated by law how long such a data can be processed and uh, how long it can be stored. In um, concerning the restrictions of the exercise of the right of erasure, I leave it to Martin who will uh, take you uh, through it. I think I will uh, stop at this stage and um, and I'm looking forward to the discussions and in particular uh, a further discussion on the joint controllership, which, um, um, yeah, well, I dwell too long on other issues and I'm not able to cover now. Thank you very much. We thank you very much for this very rich presentation, a lot of detail, a lot of information on this substantive piece of regulation. For me, I would say we have to carry on three things and which we will elaborate now more. It's the concept of personal data, the concept of who is responsible, and the concept of the rights of the data subjects. And this will now be more the, uh, discussed in the further presentations. Sandrine, please. Thank you. Katarina, I'm very grateful that you managed to expose uh, the rights of data subjects because then it offers me an easy transition. <laughs> I would have been a bit embarrassed otherwise. So Katarina then explained the, the rights of data subjects over their personal data. The question that I want to explore now is how these fundamental rights, you can move directly to slide four, is how these fundamental rights interact with the duty of professional secrecy that EU law imposes on uh, supervisory authorities. Just to avoid uh, misunderstandings, my presentation will focus on professional secrecy and not on banking secrecy. So I won't address uh, possible obligations and possible conflicts between data protection obligations and the obligations that banks have to protect the confidentiality of the data uh, entrusted upon them by their clients. Um, 
Those of you who attended the 2020 editions of this legal conference may remember um, the panel on um, professional secrecy where it was explained that um, professional secrecy of supervisory authorities is not only meant to safeguard the private interests of banks, but is also, and I dare say, maybe first and foremost, aimed to protect a general public interest, which is the proper functioning of the banking system. And that is based on the assumption that if banks do not have the assurance that the data that they give to the supervisor will remain confidential, then um, the flow of information between the supervised entities and the supervisor may be impaired and same as the flow of information between one supervisory authority in a member state and a supervisory authority in another member states in the context of um, the common market. So this consideration, this general public interest um, was um, confirmed by uh, the Court of Justice in a series of preliminary rulings and the year 2018 has been uh, particularly uh, fruitful in that respect because we had uh, three judgments of the court, we had Buccioni, Baumeister and UBS Europe that, that the same year. So it's a little bit against this background uh, that the question arises of how does this professional secrecy obligation, which aims to foster an objective of general public interest, how does it interact between a fundamental right, which is the right to data uh, protection? Are these antagonistic? And if there are possible tensions, how can they uh, be um, resolved? But before um, starting to address that question, um, I think we need to ask another. I think we need to uh, ask ourselves a question: Do supervisors protect personal data at all? Because personal data is information relating to a natural person, and it's not uh, immediately clear since the object of prudential supervision, so the supervised entities or legal persons, it may sound counterintuitive that supervisors would process personal data. On the other hand, those of you who um, work in banking supervision know that, uh, of course, um, legal persons are operated by natural persons, that natural persons are the recipients of banking services, that banks have exposures to natural persons, and also the concept of processing in the data protection um, union framework is defined very broadly. So it starts from the collection of the data to various forms of storing, and it does not necessarily require that um, the authority who holds the data actively uses them. Um, so that explains that, um, you can move to the next slide, that uh, supervisory authorities actually do hold, or if I want to use a technically correct term, process a fair amount of personal data. For instance, in the context of fit and proper assessments of members of the management body, when assessing suitability of shareholders or proposed acquirers uh, of qualifying holdings in the context of on-site inspections, notably on credit risks, following a whistleblower, uh, complaint, and these data can range from financial or administrative data details of a natural person, their criminal records, and it can even cover uh, information about the family relationships of individuals. So that's when um, the, as the existence of conflicts of interests uh, is assessed when assessing the um, suitability of members of the management body. So, um, therefore, next slide, please. Um, therefore, you see that supervisors do hold personal data. So, that's the first uh, takeaway from 
uh, this presentation. Then comes the next preliminary question, which is that is there any possible conflict? Because what supervisors, uh, when they are um, processing um, personal data, their obligation under the data protection framework, so their obligation vis-a-vis -vis data subjects, is to provide access to the data of the data subject itself. So how can that possibly conflict with their professional secrecy? It's not that they have an obligation to provide data concerning other data subjects. And to answer this preliminary question, uh, we will move on the next slide to, um, well, first two things. First, a brief overview of the professional secrecy regime to see what it covers. So where can there be a conflict? And then uh, a brief analysis of two in particular, I singled out two rights of data subjects, which are the right of access and the right of information. So how the scope of these rights then can come into conflict with um, professional secrecy. If you can go back to the um, previous slide, yes. The legal basis for professional secrecy um, regime lies in uh, Article 53 of the CRD, which is made applicable to the ECB through Article 27 of the SSM regulation. I will come back to this provision uh, later when I will see the possible hierarchy uh, between data protection and professional secrecy. So just keep it in mind. Um, under Article 53, you see it on the um, left-hand side of uh, the presentation. In order to be covered by professional secrecy, information must fulfill three main conditions. It must be received by persons employed by supervisors in the course of their duties, and information must be on a confidential nature. You will see that I've put a little asterisk by um, close to persons employed, that's just because the text of Article um, 53, and that is a common feature of most provisions um, laying down professional secrecy obligation. So the text of Article 53 gives the impression that the obligation is imposed only and foremost on natural persons. You have the same uh, characteristic in Article 27 of the SSM regulation. Uh, you have the same also in uh, th Article 37 of the statute or Article 339 of, um, of the Treaty on the Functioning of the EU. And of course, it doesn't mean that the supervisory authority is only bound is only bound by professional secrecy through the obligation that is imposed on uh, on these um, natural persons. So it's the authority itself is directly bound by the obligation. If I take the example of the CRD, you find confirmation of that in following um, provisions, uh, notably those on exchange of information. You also find uh, a confirmation of this in uh, in the case law of uh, of the court uh, of justice. Then another um, textual uh, comment um, is that professional secrecy does not only cover information received by the supervisory authority, but it also covers information which is produced by uh, the supervisory authority. So, for instance, the assessment that the supervisor makes on the basis of the data that it has received from the bank or that it has collected from other sources, the supervisory authority's assessment is in itself covered by um, professional secrecy. Then we have the second um, condition uh, that the information must be, uh, no, it was the same slide, the second condition, which is that the information must be produced in the course of the exercise of supervisory duties. And then just a small clarification. Uh, this is, of course, broader than just financial information about the bank. For instance, when we have, um, when we receive information for the purpose of an assessment of 
um, reputation and professional competence in the context of assessment of um, proposed acquisitions of qualifying holdings. It's not it, it does not necessarily cover information, financial information about a bank. It will cover information about uh, the criminal history of the proposed acquirer or um, his education details, but that is also uh, information protected by um, professional secrecy. So not only information about uh, numbers. I mentioned earlier, for instance, um, family relationships between individuals are also covered by professional secrecy when we receive that kind of information in the context of assessment of conflicts of interest. So you will see that there's all, or we already see that what seemed to be two completely separate worlds, the personal data of a natural person and then professional secrecy of a supervisory authority uh, actually do have points, um, do have points of friction. Then I come to the third criteria, which is that the information must be confidential. The court has clearly said uh, that, or clearly clarified, depending on your view, that uh, not all information that is held by a supervisory authority is confidential in nature. So you need to add it as a third layer of uh, assessment. The um, concept of confidentiality is not defined in the Capital Requirements Directive, neither is it defined in any other um, sectoral uh, legislation, so legislation and secondary legislation in the financial sector. Um, and, and, and therefore, the, the court uh, provided a uniform definition of that concept of confidentiality in the Baumeister case. So this is one of the, the QV 2018 uh, cases that I mentioned uh, earlier. And the test is divided in two parts and the second part has two limbs. The first part is that to be confidential, the information must not be public. The second part is that you must assess that the disclosure of the information is likely to affect, and there you have the two limbs. First, the interest of the person who provided the information or the interest of third parties. These are the private interests covered in the first limb. And the second limb is, uh, so that's an or, it's not an E, so it, there's not cumulative conditions. They are alternative, these two ones. Um, the proper functioning of the system for banking supervision. If that interest is likely to be affected by disclosure, then information is confidential. I had promised you that I would do a quick overview of uh, the rights of data subjects to see where uh, these frictions, but we've already seen that uh, some might come, so where they can um, arise. Data subjects first have the right to access their personal data. In this respect, um, the supervisor must, oh, sorry, the controller must, uh, when it receives a request, must inform uh, the data subject about the legality of the processing. And what is interesting to note is that it only needs to inform of the legal basis for the processing, but in our case, uh, it would be sufficient to say that data is processed in the context of the um, performance of the ECB's task under the SSM regulation. There's no need to identify the type of supervisory procedure, so you do not need to say, um, we have been collecting your data uh, in the context of a, a reassessment of uh, your fitness and property as a manager. No, you just say in the context of um, the, um, the ECB's task under the SSM regulation. The second thing that, well, the second thing, no, the second thing on my slide, but there are many other, as you see, information that the controller must give, is uh, inform about the content of uh, the data and in this respect to, to allow a bit what, the, sorry, to define a bit what the scope of this obligation is, 
you have to think of the purpose. The purpose of this obligation is to allow data subjects to check whether the information processed by the process, the controller is correct. So to exercise the right of rectification. And therefore you must um, provide um, the information that allows to exercise the right of verification. One issue that arises in this context is whether the um, data subject have the right to access the raw data or whether they have to uh, be provided with the supervisor's assessment, I mean, the controller's assessment, the authority's assessment, which is based on such data. And here you have a standard view, um, which say, according to which it would it is sufficient to provide data subjects with a full summary of the raw data. And that uh, is based on the consideration that the assessment, which would be based on such raw data, is not as such subject to a check of accuracy under the data protection uh, legislation. This is the view that um, was uh, clarified by um, the Court of Justice. And then you have another view, which is um, broader, which is currently to be found in draft guidelines uh, of the European Data Protection Board, um, and which is that um, the access must cover not only the raw data, but also the result of any subsequent analysis or assessment. What is not very clear um, is whether the case law on which this broader view is based was a case law of general application, uh, in which case it might call for a review of the standard view, which is in the first bullet point, or whether this case law is really has to be limited to the type of cases uh, that gave rise to this judgment of the court and which was the uh, review of exam papers. Um, and that um, story will tell us. Then there's a second right of data subject that can give rise to um, frictions, which is, uh, if you can go to the next slide, um, the right to be informed. And I mean with that, the right uh, to be informed ex officio, that is without having to ask for it. Um, so the right to be informed that the um, your personal data are processed and that right arises or that obligate, the corresponding obligation arises for the controller when it is processing information that it did not directly receive from the data subject, but that it received from a third party. So it allows the data subject to know a little bit um, what, what is happening with um, their data. Then comes the question, do we have possible conflicts? If we take stock of what we've seen so far concerning the scope of professional secrecy and the extent of the information that supervisors must provide to data subject, I think that the intermediate conclusion is that there is little room for conflict. Why? Because the controller does not need to reveal the type of procedure in the context of which the data is processed. So it would not need to reveal its supervisory strategy, which would then fall under professional secrecy. A second reason is that the information to be provided is data on natural persons and that it will only be provided to these persons who either ask it or in the case of information, uh, those persons who are concerned by the data. So it's a bit difficult to imagine that such disclosure could affect the interest of this person, the interest of third parties or the interest of the system for banking supervision, which are the three conditions we saw earlier that under the Baumeister test um, define what information is confidential and therefore um, protected by professional secrecy. In addition, I would say that the data subject's right of access 
um, in that case, the disclosure is in principle limited to the raw data and not to the subsequent assessment, which is carried out by uh, the supervisory authority by using this data. So um, it seems that it's more likely that conflicts would arise, and these are the two cases uh, that I listed on the slide, in the case where the supervisor is uh, has the duty to inform that it processes information that it received from a third party, because that could have an alerting effect. Uh, and then in certain cases, that's the case of the credit files, it can even, you can imagine that it can have an impact on the bank's reputation. How these conflicts between the right to be informed are um, treated, I mean, how this right to be informed is treated by uh, the ECB uh, in the context of uh, its data protection obligations. This will be uh, addressed by uh, Martin, so we will have to wait a little bit longer. You can move on the, on the next slide. But still, there remains situations. So even if the scope for conflict is, I would say prima facie rather limited, there remain situations where a conflict exists. And we have, when we have these situations, how do we resolve these tensions? Does professional secrecy trump data protection? Because professional secrecy would pursue an objective of general public interest, while data protection being a fundamental right is still directed only at the protection of one individual, or is it the only way around? Do we consider that data protection being a fundamental right necessarily trumps professional secrecy? Or is there a middle way, a balancing exercise that has been done either by the legislator or that could be done in an ad hoc way um, that would allow these uh, two, um, these two um, principles to uh, coexist? Martin will explain the interaction between um, the chart, so the hierarchy between the charter and uh, an article, I mean, and secondary legislation um, in general, and uh, the possible limits that secondary law can impose on uh, fundamental rights under Article 52 of the charter. I will just um, um, I will just break the secret now that the, that the result of this analysis is that Article 53 does not meet the, the test, or Article 53 of the CRD, professional secrecy, does not meet the test um, to limit the fundamental rights. So we have, um, so we have to um, dig a little bit um, uh, deeper. You will see on my slide that I did not envisage a conflict between two fundamental rights, because you could have, on the one hand, data protection as a fundamental right, and then on the other hand, you could also have um, the freedom to uh, exercise a business, Article 16 of the Charter, or the protection of, um, of uh, property rights, Article uh, 15. These rights, the second part, would uh, somehow, in certain circumstances, uh, be covered by the interests, the private interests protected by professional secrecy. And I did not envisage that kind of conflict because um, I, I failed to see a, a practical cases where I could imagine that um, providing to a data subject information about the data that we have about this person would constitute a breach of Article 16 of the Charter, freedom to exercise a business, or Article 17, especially 17.2, maybe um, um, intellectual um, property rights. So that's uh, just because uh, maybe of my lack of imagination <laughs> that uh, this does not figure on the slide. But if we come back to the secondary legislation that we have, um, Article, sorry, the uh, European Data Protection Regulation is silent about the articulation between professional secrecy and data protection. It doesn't have a general exception that would exclude personal data covered by professional secrecy from its scope. 
it, it has um, one specific uh, exception covering professional secrecy, but as it relates to the right of information, I will leave to uh, Martin to explain. Uh, but in any event, it is a, a specific and not a, not a general uh, exception in a, in a specific context. On the other hand, the Capital Requirements Directive in its Article 62 does have provisions on uh, data protection. And it uh, clearly imposes on uh, competent authorities, so on supervisors, the obligation to uh, respect the uh, applicable EU data protection framework in the context of their supervisory tasks. And there I come back to Article 27 of the SSM regulation, which I announced earlier. You could say, well, but Article 27 of the SSM regulation only makes uh, the CRD provisions applicable to uh, the ECB as far as uh, they concern mm -hmm. professional secrecy and exchange of information, but it doesn't have uh, a renvoi to uh, data protection. But that, uh, I think, is not, um, is not a very uh, convincing argument because Article 62 of the CRD is precisely inserted in the section entitled Exchange of Information and Professional Secrecy. So it's indirectly um, covered. And we also have a confirmation of, sorry, it's uh, implicitly covered. Um, and we also have a confirmation of this interpretation of the SSM regulation in, in its recital 27 that uh, clearly states that the union data protection framework is fully applicable to the processing of personal data by the ECB for the purposes of the SSM regulation. So the conclusion is that supervisors, so we saw there is a limited scope where conflicts might remain. And at this limited scope, supervisors may not oppose their professional secrecy obligations to decline disclosure obligations to data subjects. However, even in this case, you can go to the next slide, even in these cases where a conflict may exist, we have a tool in Article 25 of the EU DPR where the legislature has allowed uh, institutions to balance uh, certain interests. Martin will explain later what are the conditions to activate this provision in order to restrict the controller's data protection obligations. This tool has been implemented by the ECB in a decision. You have the reference number on the slide. And this decision provides for certain restrictions of data subjects' rights when the exercise of these rights would jeopardize or adversely affect the performance of the ECB supervisory task or the safety and soundness of banks and the stability of the financial system. I would like just to conclude uh, on that slide that you see from these two criteria, like these two cases where rights can be restricted, there's a third one, but also Martin will address it, uh, and it's less related to professional secrecy, and these two are more related because they echo a lot of the Baumeister test. The one thing that they do not echo is the first limb of the Baumeister test, so the protection of individual interests. Um, that would render information confidential and therefore subject to professional secrecy. We do not have an exception in this decision implementing Article 25. We do not have an, ex an exception that would allow to restrict the rights um, to protect this information. However, theoretical, a possible conflict uh, may seem. In case of a conflict, one thing that should not be forgotten is that the controller can still apply certain provisions of the EU DPR in order not to provide the information that would be, for instance, if the rights of the bank or third parties would be affected by disclosure. But still, 
this is not totally the same as the first part of the Baumeister test, because the first part of the Baumeister, Baumeister test refers to the protection of an interest. It's if the interest of a person is likely to be uh, adversely affected, while Article 14, uh, sorry, Article 17.4 of the EU, EU DPR uh, sets the bar higher and requires a um, a conflict with rights of a third party and not only uh, interest. I think that I have to stop because of time. Uh, maybe we can address that uh, later in case of in case. Of <clears throat> thank you. Yeah, thank you again very much for this also very rich presentation. I would take four points here. Personal data can be uh, data that is subject to professional secrecy obligations. The two conflicts are access to personal data and right to be informed. The solution may bring us back to the conflict, uh, to the uh, hierarchy of norms, which Martin will discuss a bit more, and Article 24 may provide a reconciliation instrument. So that brings us, after exploring now the room for conflict between data protection and professional secrecy, and having first gotten the impression on what are the data protection rules to the third part, which Martin will cover in particular, how do we comply with these data protection rules as supervisors and what is the role of the data protection officer in this field? Thank you. Thank you very much, Klaus, and also a warm welcome from my side to all meeting participants on this beautiful sunny day here in Frankfurt. So we have seen that uh, data protection is a fundamental right um, in the union. And Sandrine mentioned that the two worlds, the possible friction between um, professional secrecy and data protection. And so this really begs the question, does data protection actually undermine effective banking supervision? Now, I profoundly believe that the exceptions and restrictions that GDPR and UDPR makes available actually allow a reconciliation between the two. And that transparency and professional secrecy are not mutually exclusive, but complementary objectives. Next slide, please. Now, Klaus and also Carolina mentioned data protection as a fundamental right, meaning that all, not only the legal acts, but also all administrative decisions, for example, a fit and proper assessment um, by, um, for example, the ECB as a banking supervisor, but also national competent authorities must respect this principle, observe its principles, and also promote it. But of course, like almost all uh, fundamental rights, it's not an absolute right. Now, the Court of Justice has uh, specified that um, when the, a fundamental right is limited, that the legal basis which permits this interference to the fundamental right must itself define the scope of the limitation. So the mere fact that banking supervision is undoubtedly an objective in the general interest of the union is not sufficient to limit, of course, data protection. So in the next slides, we will actually explore how the right to data protection can be limited and under what circumstances. Well, here um, are a number of data subject rights that Carolina already have introduced. Um, and the first and very important exception is that a controller, so the entity that holds the personal data actually can decline a data subject request in case if it is unfounded or excessive. Now, these obligations that the controller have, they must always be interpreted in the light of fairness and proportionality. Um, and here there's a balance that must be struck between, on the one hand, the data subject's rights, and on the other hand, the burden that is imposed upon the controller. Now, very important is that to understand that as a data subject, one must not justify, explain why one makes use of a data subject request. Now, in an ongoing uh, case before the Court of Justice, Advocate General Petruzella um, has made a statement saying that a fair balance leans towards greater attention being paid to the protection of data subjects. Um, and, and that is because there is the burden of demonstrating the unfoundness or excessiveness um, lies with the controller. Um, and I think it is fair to say that we have seen in, in recent years that the Court of Justice leans towards a very data subject friendly interpretation of GDPR and EU DPR. So what exactly is this excessiveness um, and what would actually determine whether or not a request is excessive? There's various elements. First of all, it depends on the sector 
um, in which the controller operates. It also depends on how often changes occur to personal data. Um, it also depends whether actually a refusal to such a data subject request, um, what damage would it constitute to the individual? What is the period that is covered? For example, there's a court case from the Berlin Brandenburg court saying a request that covers more than 50 years is excessive. Um, and also, of course, the sensitivity and the quantity of personal data. And I think as a rule of thumb, one could say the higher the risk to the individual, the narrower the exception should be interpreted. And to make a very concrete example, in an ongoing assessment of the fitness and propriety of um, a future member of the management of a credit institution, it is less likely that this is excessive because simply there are constantly changes are made to personal data and there is very likely to be a lot of sensitive personal data, for example, a copy of a criminal record. Once the fit and proper assessment has been concluded and there's no further operation on personal data and ideally some of the sensitive personal data, such as a criminal record, has been omitted from the file, repeated requests for access are more likely to be excessive. Then, taking a look at different transparency obligations. As a controller, one has to provide certain information to a data subject, for example, the purposes of the processing, the time limits, um, the contact details of the DPO, and so forth. Um, well, first of all, if the data subject has already information, there is no obligation to provide this information again. It's very natural, actually. But of course, as always, the burden of proof lies with the controller. For example, therefore, sometimes it can be useful that one has proved that the privacy statement has been provided. The next more important exception is in, ca in case um, the, um, the provision of the information um, is impossible or would involve a disproportionate effort. Um, again, a balance needs to be made. It's not only focused on the controller, but it's also looking at what are the data subjects' interest, and then this balance must be uh, struck. Here, I would say as an example, in banking supervision, for example, if a GST um, has a loan tape with um, information of individuals, from several thousand individuals, it would be impossible or at least disproportionate if SSM would have to individually inform all of these data subjects. I think here the solution would be actually that it is the credit institution informing their customers that potentially the SSM as banking supervisor may obtain their personal data. The next exception would be that the provision of the information is likely to render impossible or seriously impair the achievement of the objective. Now, of course, this presupposes that the processing satisfies all data protection principles, such as legality and proportionality and so forth. Here, as an example, one could take, for example, the future European reporting system for material CFT AML weaknesses, the so-called Eureka database on um, money, money laundering. Of course, if data subjects would be informed as soon as their name is included in a database of suspicious transactions for money laundering, of course, this would completely undermine and the objective of this database. So this is, for example, an ex where, this, uh, ex where this exception actually could be invoked. Of course, these exceptions are always limited in time and must be re-evaluated regularly. Then the next exception would actually be um, when the provision of information um, that the obtaining or disclosure is expressly laid down by union law and then this is also important, this is added, which provides appropriate measures to protect the data subject interests. So, for example, let's take a look at the whistleblowing mechanism in Article 23 SSMR um, that the ECB operates. Of course, this is laid down in union law, so this qualifies the first part of this exception. However, there's a second cumulative criterion which says that there needs to be these appropriate measures for data subjects. These are not in Article 23 SSMR, and this is, for example, therefore probably not suited to reject a request to access whistleblowing reports. But there are other solutions, of course. And that actually brings us to the last exception for the transparency obligations, which is that where personal data must remain confidential, subject to an obligation of professional secrecy regulated by union law, which Sandrine has previously um, explained in great detail. Now, classic examples are, of course, a lawyer-client relationship, uh, the protection of journalistic sources or medical confidentiality, but also ECB staff, also the members of the ECB governing bodies, 
um, and staff of national central banks and competent authorities also have um, an obligation of professional secrecy. Now, this is not a blank check to turn down any data subject request. This actually only provides an opportunity to occasionally apply an exception when it must remain confidential. But I think in a case of a whistleblowing report, this is definitely um, a justified situation. As a little side note, data protection officers also are bound by the secrecy, um, by the duty of secrecy and confidentiality in the performance of their tasks. So, for example, if a DPO advises a GST and obtains person data of a bank employee, then this bank, um, the DPO doesn't need to inform the bank employee and can also um, turn down a request to access his or her data. The most common, most important data protection right is the right of access. We have every year quite a number of those uh, at the ECB. Now here, as a little preliminary remark, this is not the same as the right to public access to documents, which is something different. This is to access your own personal data. Now, the first um, exception, of course, and this might sound um, very trivial, but it is not, is that it must be in the possession of the controller. Well, first of all, of course, it's not in the possession of the controller in case it is deleted. And here I emphasize again the duty of a controller of data minimization to delete data, personal data that is not needed. That is actually your way out of receiving personal data requests. This is not having personal data in the first place. So this is a very important aspect. But the other part is also that sometimes the controller doesn't have the information yet. One of the information a data subject may receive is, for example, who are you transferring my data to? But this is not always known at the outset. Um, limiting the right to access in time, for example, to only the last one year when the data is stored for a much longer period, of course, is not a fair balance. Um, and this was confirmed in the so-called Rekabut case by the Court of Justice. Now, the other exception is that the right to obtain a copy that adversely affects the rights and freedoms of others. And here, it's not just the mere fact that it affects, but it needs to be adversely affect an other person. Now, here's an example from the Finnish Data Protection Authority. We are requesting a copy of personal data from a spouse of a bank account that is actually adversely affecting her. Now, I think if two um, spouses have a case against each other before Data Protection Authority, probably data protection is the least of your concerns. Now, if it says others, who is it referring to? This is, of course, um, the con any individual in the first place, but it could also be the controller or the processor, for example, um, in a GST report, the names of members of staff of NCAs, for example, might be mentioned. It could be that we need to omit them if they, if the provision of their names will actually adversely affect them. Which brings us to the next data protection right, which is the, the right to um, erasure. Um, of course, um, here the exception is exercising the right of freedom of expression and information, very important, for example, requesting a newspaper to delete a name in a press article, um, also the establishment of exercise of legal claims um, or the compliance with the legal obligation. I think from banking supervision, most importantly, is the exception of the performance of a task carried out in the public interest. Banking supervision, by definition, is carried out in the public interest. Now, as a counterexample, for example, in a fit and proper assessment, in principle, um, the data would be kept and, and there would be no grounds to raise it. However, in case a candidate withdraws his or her application, then, of course, SSM would have to demonstrate that there is still a legal obligation to retain the personal data after the withdrawal. And that would have to be assessed case by case. Next slide, please. Now, these are the exceptions um, that you will find in, in GDPR, UDPR. And now I focus on restrictions. And our restrictions are different in, in several facets. First of all, the restrictions under GDPR, they are actually um, provided for by the union or member state law by way of a legislative measure. And they are about all data subject rights. Now, when it says legislative act, and um, that does not mean that it needs to be adopted by the parliament. I think the Court of Justice and also the European Court of Human Rights um, has repeatedly stressed what is important is that this legal act is sufficiently clear and gives individuals an adequate indication of the circumstances in and conditions under which controllers are empowered 
to resort to such a restriction. So that's really the element of forcibility. Now, under EU DPR, the legal acts, they are adopted on the basis of the treaties or internal rules laid down by the union institutions. Like Sandrine mentioned, the ECB has adopted such a decision last year for banking supervisions. Now, under EU DPR, oddly, not all data subject rights can be restricted. For example, the right to object and also to automated individual decision making is not included under EU DPR. So there is some nuances, there are some differences um, between both legal regimes. What we see in practice is that national competent authorities tend to rely on exceptions um, because they are given by GDPR, whereas EU institutions such as um, our banking supervision colleagues, they tend to resort to restrictions because they are adopted by ourselves. Next slide, please. Now, restrictions always need to respect the essence of the fundamental rights and freedoms, and it always must be necessary and proportionate in our democratic society that we enjoy. Now, there's a quite long list um, that of safeguards um, that allow to take institutions to adopt um, restrictions. I would only focus on two. The first one is other important objectives of general public interest. So this obviously includes banking supervision. Next slide, please. And then most importantly, of course, a monitoring inspection or regulatory function connected to even occasionally the exercise of an official um, authority. So this is definitely also the case uh, in, in banking supervision. Now, also here, interesting enough, under EDPR, we have a number of additional safeguards, for example, internal security of the union, um, but also, for example, common foreign uh, policy, which are not included under GDPR. Next slide, please. Now, as you might have seen already in, in the previous slides, there is a difference between GDPR and UDPR. And for someone working as a DPO at the ECB, who interacts, of course, on a daily basis with national competent authorities who fall under GDPR, of course, this is something that we day to day actually witness. As I mentioned, there are material differences. For example, the EU DPR restricts the application, um, whereas GDPR restricts the scope of the obligation and rights. The restrictions um, are different. And there's also a number of differences in the wording. For example, breaches of ethics for regulated professions is mentioned under GDPR, but not under EU DPR. Now, if you look at the restriction decisions as the ECB, we have taken the restriction decisions, NCAs do not have such a possibility. Now, whereas member states can actually decide to further restrict or further um, implement GDPR, it is not fully harmonized. Um, two examples would be, for example, the processing of criminal convictions um, for rise between member states, and that is important, for example, for fit and proper assessments. Another example is that some member states allow the restriction of access and erasure rights of credit registers, for example, in Spain. Now, this really means that that we treat individuals differently just depending on the applicable restrictions. So, for example, if um, a new board member of a credit institution in member state A, when he or she wants to access fitness and propriety information, it could be restricted, whereas in another member state, there may not be the possibility to restrict it simply because of different national laws. And then as a third avenue, this person might also request access or other rights at the ECB when then the ECB restriction decision applies. And this becomes particularly problematic in cases of joint controllership. Well, in two words, what is a joint controllership? That is simply several controllers jointly determine the means and purposes, so they're jointly responsible for the processing. They need to conclude an agreement and then jointly process personal data. This is something, for example, that could be the case between ECB as banking supervisors and national competent authorities or NCBs. Now, here's the first issue. As a data subject, one has always the right to address any controller. This is foreseen in Article 26, Paragraph 3 of EU DPR GDPR, that actually, no matter what the joint controllership agreement determines, you can always address any controller if you want to access it. Now, obviously, as a data subject, what you will do is you will access that controller where there is the least restrictive um, provisions in place. So this bears risk of forum shopping, or you could issue simultaneous data subject requests and then possibly have different outcomes. Of course, with joint controllers, you have different data protection supervisory authorities. 
at the ECB, we fall under the EDPS, whereas at national level, you have one or more national data protection authorities, which leads, of course, to a fractured interpretation of exceptional restrictions. And in cases a complaint is lodged, that probably data subjects might opt actually for the strictest data protection authority. And we have seen that the enforcement of GDPR is one of its Achilles heels. Also, the administrative fines. Um, GDPR does not stipulate whether or not a public administration can um, be sanctioned. This is for national law to determine. So there's a lot of variety between um, member states, whereas under EU DPR, the EDPS can impose administrative fines, for example, upon the ECB. And then lastly, also for liability, the EU DPR does not specific, specifically deal with non-compliance. It just states that those who have suffered material or non-material damage they shall have a right to receive compensations. Whereas GDPR, and this was very well known in 2018, and this was one of the things that press focused very much on, the very detailed and far-reaching rules on compensation and liability. And also interesting in the context of joint controllership agreements that each controller or processor are held liable for the entire damage. And um, also this is an important aspect. And this is not the case for the ECB not falling under GDPR. So this is another um, example of a scattered landscape of restrictions. And here the point I really wanted to make is that this raises questions about do we really treat union citizens equally when it is about the same personal data process for the same purposes on the same individuals and yet it is treated differently simply because of a different responsible entity. And obviously here my view is that I think further harmonization would be beneficial from a practitioner's perspective. Next slide please. Now, as Carolina mentioned at the outset, GDPR really meant to cut down red tape. There was a principle of accountability, plays a lot of responsibility on the controller to make this very difficult balance this, between professional secrecy and data protection. And I think here the DPO plays a very important role. Now, I will not uh, go into too much details of the tasks of the DPO. I think half a century after the um, entry into force of GDPR, I think the existence and the raison d'etre of DPOs is acknowledged. The form most we inform and advise. We also monitor compliance. I think data protection impact assessments are a very important tool to make those risk-based decisions. We are also the liaison to supervisory authorities. And this is again a difference with GDPR under UDPR. A DPO also has investigative powers. This is not the case for DPOs under GDPR. Now, given that the DPO is an important stakeholder to ensure that this right balance is struck in banking supervision, Next slide, please. Um, the law also has provided for a number of um, safeguards. The first one is actually that the DPO shall be involved in a properly and in a timely manner. Now, sounds very intuitive, and I think every, nobody would disagree, but the practice, of course, is not always the same. This, for example, means that the DPO should be part of different working groups. For example, at the ECB, the DPO is part of the Operation Risk Committee or the Project Steering Committee. It is also important that the DPO participates in meetings of senior middle management. This is the advice of the Article 29 Data Protection Working Party. Now, sometimes it's very obvious that the DPO needs to be consulted. For example, in case of a data breach, it's a legal obligation. Sometimes it's less obvious, for example, in banking supervision, um, when banking supervisors are planning to share credit quality review data from on-site inspection or when they're considering using artificial intelligence for the sub-tech initiative or, for example, when wanting to use a public cloud for banking supervision. Now, the DPO provides an opinion. One doesn't have to follow the opinion. But also here, the Article 29 Working Party made very clear that in case of disagreement, it is recommended to document the reasons for not following DPO advice. A number of cases that we have seen uh, in recent years in Luxembourg, for example, a company was uh, fined because the DPO was not sufficiently involved in the subsidiary company in Luxembourg, although um, the DPO participated in several meetings at group level, but the DPO um, was not involved in a direct, formal and permanent manner at operational level at the Luxembourg company. Now, in case you're still not convinced to involve your DPO, it's not only an act of good administration, it can also pay off financially. The Italian DPA lowered the amount of a sanction because the controller had involved the DPO and complied in good faith with his or her opinion. And then finally, there's also an interesting case by the Belgian Data Protection Authority that the DPO must be consulted before a decision is made and given the necessary time to take and make an independent data protection risk assessment. 
and must be informed of the final decision. But of course, and want to emphasize it once again, a DPO is an advisor and is not responsible for the decision. The next provision is an EU DPR and GDPR as a controller must support the DPO. Now, first of all, it needs to be supported with the most precious resource of our times, which is time. I think the time that DPOs can do their work part-time is, is becoming less um, prevalent. I think most, the, most organizations have a full-time DPO, and we have seen in a 2020 report where we, uh, invest, where we interviewed all uh, national central banks that over half of the DPOs actually were a team or DPO was supported by a team. Now, what determines a bit the, uh, what are the elements to determine the number of staff? It's first of all, um, the level of risk to natural persons. And I think the number of DPAs give, give an idea. In banking supervision, for example, subtech, fit and prop assessments are just two examples where we concluded DPAs. It also depends on how sensitive is your processing activity. For example, are you processing criminal records, which we do for fit and proper. And the quantity of processing activities, this 2020 report found that some NCAs, the, the number of processing activities varies between 16 to 550 processing activities across NCBs. And of course, the number of cross-border transfers, because that has become after the so-called Schrems II judgment, a very complicated and thorny issue. And lastly, what is also important is that it is important that the designation of the DPO is officially communicated to staff so that staff can contact them. And here an example from last year where a Luxembourg public entity was fined because the contact details of the DPO were not easy to find and were only accessible in English, which of course in Luxembourg is not acceptable. The other element is that the um, DPO shall have access to personal data. That means not only supportive services such as human resources, but also core business areas for example, uh, those staff responsible for granting authorization requests, I think having a, a good network and, and regular exchanges with colleagues across the organization is key for uh, successful data protection. Last element here is also that um, DPOs must be in a position to stay up to date about developments, and there are plenty. If you look at the docket of the Court of Justice, the number of cases on data protection is skyrocketing at the moment. And there must be also be allowed to participate in the necessary training. In this 2020 report, we found that only one third of DPOs of NCBs and NCAs have been issued actually with certification. So there's room for improvement. Now, the DPO shall also be independent, very important, and directly report to the highest management level. That is certainly the case here at the ECB. Also, the DPO is bound by secrecy and confidentiality. That's particularly important in case data subjects want to share or ask questions to the DPO. And finally, if the DPO has other tasks, they may not result in a conflict of interest. So for example, what are no-goes? What we have seen in case law is, for example, somebody who is a DPO and an IT manager that doesn't work. Also somebody who is a director audit or head of compliance and being a DPO are also not possible. And independent of the title, somebody who is actually tasked to delete personal data can also not be a DPO because it's an operational task and that would undermine the independence. Next slide, please. Which brings me to my last slide. Um, and that is very shortly to wrap up a case study to show how these restrictions and exceptions, how do they interact with a very concrete case? So imagine we the ECB receives a, a whistleblowing report, um, which of course contains on the one hand personal data from the whistleblower, him or herself, as well as the names of potential wrongdoers. And so thus, as I need to inform the data subjects on the one hand, and can those data subjects, for example, this um, suspected wrongdoer, can they actually ask to access their information? And here you see on the screen at least three, so two exceptions and one restriction that could be invoked. And um, the first one is, of course, that if we would do so, at, at least in the beginning, that is likely to run the impossible or seriously impair the achievement of the objective of the whistleblower mechanism, then of course it would also undermine the obligation that the personal data must remain confidential. And lastly, we could invoke the restriction for the monitoring inspection and regulatory function. And in case this is applicable, this will not always be the case, to in case the prevention, investigation, detection, or prosecution of criminal offenses in case the whistleblowing report refers to a criminal offense. Now, what is very important, this is not something static. This is not a one-off decision. This is something that needs to be applied 
been received, and then it needs to be re-evaluated at frequent times. Um, the ECB restriction decision, for example, says every six months, um, because the exceptions and restrictions are a temporary measure, whereas the fundamental right to data protection, of course, is indefinite. Which brings me to the end of my presentation. The question was, is data protection um, and banking supervision, is this water and fire? I believe that there are sufficient options available to protect the need of secrecy and, and confidentiality in banking supervision, and that always a balance can be found. And it is true that, of course, they pursue different interests, um, and then one could obliterate the other, absolutely. But I think like in real life, with water and fire, you need them both, and when they complement each other, their value is maximized. Martin, thank you very much for this uh, presentation. And in a real world, I would give now all, my, all the presenters a big applause. So I give a- If you allow me, if you allow me, Klaus, I'm, I'm, yes. I'm sorry to come in because I would like to make, if you allow me, some comments on one of the slides of Martin when I'm not sure, because I, I think I, I'm, I do not fully uh, agree if you allow me. Can we go back to the slide on the scattered landscape of risk? I would say, but, well, then we come, come to this, uh, open the question, and I make one few housekeeping measures, and then I give you the floor for the slide, and we can perhaps okay. go to that slide. Which slide we, was it? Okay, because I yeah. thought we were finishing now. No, no we, we get still have all questions. Now the interesting part is uh, happening. We will ask the, the colleagues. And we have a few questions uh, from the audience, and I don't know how you feel. This was intense, uh, and so we have perhaps a moment to breathe. And Martin, thank you for ending on a positive note that there always can be struck a balance between uh, data protection needs and the need to protect the secrecy from the banking supervisor's perspective. And based on this, I would now open the floor uh, for the questions. And uh, as I said, Carolina, I will give it first to you. But for the housekeeping to the colleagues who has not yet raised its hand, and I think our colleagues here deserve a lot of hands, although they made a lot of things very clear, but I'm sure there are still questions. So you should do it now. A few colleagues have done, uh, but please feel free to do it now. And then if you are given the floor, uh, please unmute yourself, uh, turn on the camera and wait a second before the line is there, then you can start speaking. And Carolina, now the floor is yours to start the discussion. It just, well, it, I don't think it will be really like a discussion. I would like to, uh, to allow myself to make some remarks on the slide concerning the scattered application of the restrictions. Now, um, I'm not sure we can, first of all, whatever concerns um, um, law enforcement activities, it's outside of the scope of the application of the EU DPR, of the GDPR. Yeah? So there, I don't think we can speak really about an unequal treatment from this point of view, because it's not, um, because it's not covered by the same, um, by the same uh, legislative framework. Now, Indeed, the member states retained under Article 23 the possibility to further specify the application of the GDPR in specific areas. Indeed, there are some differences, but again, they are framed. And they are framed by the same principles of the possibilities to restrict the application of the rights, which, which were mentioned before. Finally, concerning the points on particularly problematic for joint controllership, the application of the one-stop shop and the application of the possibility to have one lead authority in joint controllerships is not excluded. What I understood that, Martin, you, you, you presumed that there will be only several authorities which will need to... Um, I don't think it's, it's, uh, it's necessarily the case. I fully agree. It will be very problematic to find it, but the lead authorities' guidelines do not exclude the possibility to apply the one-stop shop and the, in the identification of the lead authority in such, a, uh, in such setting. And again, um, I, I see your point, but the restrictions which are, uh, which are possible on the level of the member states, when the member states make use of Article 23, are very framed. 
Thank you very much. So this was just one a small, uh, 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 well, comment on, on this slide. Thank you. Good. I, I don't see any no, I'm, I of think, the head. I think you agree. Yeah, I, I agree. But it, I mean, just as, as one small point, of course, is that yes, the one-stop shop mechanism is fully acknowledged, but how would data protection authorities find out that one data subject ex that a, a data subject has made requests or complaints vis-a-vis -vis several data protection authorities? Would they always then decide to come together and take joint action? Something to be seen in practice. Um, the point was that at least in theory, this is possible, but I acknowledge all the other points. Yes, it is always framed, of course, within GDPR yeah. and is always framed by the case law by the Court of yeah. Justice. Yeah, and in uh, concerning Article 26, the joint controllers are obliged to set up an arrangement, and in this arrangement, they will need to in the, uh, identify the, 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 the data protection authority, which, of course, does not allow them to uh, circum to contract out competent authorities, but when they are processing and the, when they are starting the processing and they are informing data subjects uh, in the light of Article 12, 13, 14 GDPR and, uh, uh, and and uh, uh, well, this is particularly problematic in this setting, but uh, um, in, 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 in a fully regulated for European institutions, agencies and bodies, it's a little bit clearer. Then they indicate which is the competent authority and then the authorities co will be again cooperating and sending the complaints to each other. Thank you. As you see, and as the Germans say, the devil lies in the detail. And the second thing you can see is that the experts can get here into a deep discussion, which shall not exclude more general questions. And let me therefore open the floor. I think the first person on our list is Antonio Sigurini. Antonio, if you could unmute and uh, turn on the camera. And Antonio, good to have you here. And then you could please ask yes. questions. The floor is you. Thank you, Klaus. Uh, indeed, I'm Antonio Segurini. I work at the ECB in the Supervisory Law Division. I have first one question for Carolina, because I think you've made an interesting question during your presentation, which is why do we need a separate uh, regulation only tailored for the EU institutions? And uh, to me, that honestly, I don't have uh, experience in this field of law prior to today, it's still not entirely clear why this choice has been made by the legislator. I think had we chosen, had the legislator chosen to make one regulation for private entities and one other regulation for public institutions, this would have been made easier to understand because, of course, one thing is processing data for business purposes. One other thing is when this activity is conducted in within a public interest mandate. But since we have really a distinct body of rules only applicable to EU institutions, uh, I was wondering if you could share something more uh, with us on why this has been uh, necessary and if you have maybe in mind one or two concrete examples of uh, points of uh, regulation where there are differences that are really necessary uh, in light of the peculiar nature of, of EU institutions. I also have a second question, which is more for Martin and, and Sandrine, um, because your last uh, slide on the case of the whistleblower, the case study, made me think of uh, one uh, other, maybe similar uh, example, which is a case when we receive uh, personal data from other EU supervisory authorities, or maybe even from other non-EU supervisory authorities. And in this case, I think, uh, of course, the need to protect uh, the, the information is probably even higher, because if this is not the case, then the uh, you know, open exchange of information between supervisory authorities, which is essential to ensuring a common uh, supervisory system in the EU, and in general, a good function of banking supervision would be compromised. So I was wondering if you think one of the exceptions and restrictions you have uh, you have you have described to us can help in these cases to avoid any uh, right to inform any obligation to inform 
data subject and uh, any um, obligation to disclose such information in case of uh, a request for access. And if this could be uh, not temporary, but rather the, uh, permanent, given this particular need to ensure that cooperation between administrations is made to the extent necessary. Thank you a lot. I think then in the order you asked, Carolina, may you start? Well, I don't think I'll be able to add that much more than what I said already before. This is the specificity of the tasks of the European institution agencies and bodies. And the fact that they work only on the basis of law or task, which is indeed something specific generally for public administration. But um, again, it was it's um, in order to cater then uh, for all public administrations on the national level, this was not possible. So there will be, again, a general regulation. We would require another article along the lines of Article 23 of the GDPR, where the member states would legislate and provide for additional restrictions or grounds for processing. So, um, and, oh, well, uh, this is... Uh, this is it, uh, the specificities and the needs of the European institutions, agencies and bodies were easier to embrace in one regulation. It was not um, um, economic from the legislative point of view to have then again something more lenient for or something different. Uh, I withdraw more lenient, something different for uh, private sections, something different for for public sector when the public sector subject to the gdpr in any event will be working on the basis of law task and use the and the member states will be using article 23 in there the specificities uh, or the, the justifications i think um uh, uh, the martin's presentation uh, was was addressing this points very much explaining um when are the differences in the way uh, certain rights can be exercised because it, it, it caters already for the fact that the law will provide for the, for, for, for the restrictions and that there will be no individual assessment bearing in mind certain considerations. I hope it helps. Martin, I, I don't know whether you'd yes. like to add to it. Well, what I could add, of course, the most obvious example is that as an EU institution, we need a separate supervisor. We cannot fall on a national supervisor. So this is definitely, I think, the most tangible example why at least a separate chapter or a separate regulation uh, is needed. I think there's also simply some historic reasons for it. There was already Regulation 45-2001 in place, which was far more innovative than the Directive from 95. We had the DPOs and EU institutions long before this was uh, an, an introduced by GDPR for, for the rest. And I think therefore also, the and remember GDPR was one of the most lobbied, it was the most lobbied uh, piece of EU legislation uh, until that time. And I think I think they were just happy, you know, to have something in place and didn't want to put an additional step of including also EU institutions of course, this is not precluded in GDPR 2.0, you know, the discussion is probably open. And I think law enforcement, everybody's convinced, separate business case, separate rules, whether for EU institutions who from a railway agency to a medical agency to a central bank, it's a very different uh, kind of animal. So there's definitely um, some, some downsides to it. But I must say that in practice, of course, the large majority of provisions, EU DPR, GDPR, are the same and the jurisprudence of the court of justice even if it's on a gdpr case of course applies mutatis mutandis to eu dpr and to us as eu institutions then maybe i can just continue with your your second uh, question um when, when it comes about data flows and the um, interaction that banking supervisors have across border um, now we have to distinguish whether this takes place within the European economic area, because then actually data protection is really not an additional hurdle. But when personal data flows outside the EEA, then it either needs to be covered by a so-called adequacy decision. So then the European Commission has actually decided that there is an equivalent level of data protection available. This is the case, for example, for, for, for Canada, uh, soon for South Korea and, and other countries. Um, it is not the case anymore for the United States uh, since the Schrems II judgment. If there is not a decision, then one needs to conclude so-called standard contractual clauses, SECs, and then implement very concrete technical and organizational measures to protect personal data. 
Now, of course, your question is, shouldn't we permanently restrict the fact that, you know, uh, that a subject um, is being formed or can access the data when you receive um, such personal data or provide it to another uh, supervisory authority? And I would um, very vehemently say, no, definitely not. We cannot have a permanent restriction for, because of the fundamental right to data protection is a fundamental right. So your starting point is always you have data subject rights and only in the certain conditions we can temporarily restrict them. And I think the existing exceptions and restrictions would apply in a sec exactly the same manner when you receive the personal data from another authority because you process personal data as soon as you receive them. I would even argue when personal data starts to flow, there's so the more reason that a data subject can actually control or at least there's transparency about who processes personal data for what reasons. But again, if you receive personal data for, say, an ongoing investigation, I think the existing exceptions and restriction would allow you to temporarily not grant access to such data. I don't know, Sandrine, if you would like to add something here. Um, no, well, actually, I had a question <laughs> to you um, because, uh, and I'm thinking about uh, information to the data subject when let's say the ECB receive information collected by a third party so that we have this obligation. One of the exceptions is we don't need to inform the data subject if the information that we received would be protected by professional secrecy. That kind of exception, is it permanent? It's not permanent because it always requires a a balancing act. You always need to balance on the one hand the interest of the data subject, which for every request or every data subject might be different. And then why do you need professional secrecy? So as I said in my presentation, this is not a, a blank check. We are protected by professional secrecy and therefore we will always uh, decline any request. So it always requires this ad hoc case by case assessment. So, so if I understand well, it means that you have to periodically reassess if that information is still protected by professional secrecy. Exactly, that is very okay. true. Which is, which, is, which is in a way, it coincides with the fact that uh, in order to assess confidentiality under the Baumeister test, you always assess confidentiality at the moment where you are asked or supposed to disclose the data. So if, if for instance, you have information uh, for 10 years, then you need to uh, you need to assess whether or no that information is still confidential. But then where we may meet is that um, the exception uh, applying uh, an exception in, in that specific case, because otherwise, I, as I said, there's no general ex exception to professional secrecy. But in that specific case of information to the data subject that we've received and we will process data that were collected from a third party the exception is permanent but it has to be periodically reassessed whether it still applies exactly because Good. it could be Thank that you. over time <laughs> these reasons you know diminish and also maybe to put just an additional footnote here is that it could also be that the data subject is entitled to know that the banking supervisor processes his or her data, but that actually the right of access to the data is temporarily actually restricted. So, you know, also within those data subject rights, you need to make the assessment. But so you could be the... transparent without giving access, for example. And in the meantime, we may have deleted the data. That could well be happening, okay. yes. And this is one one of my key piece of advice to, to my <laughs> colleagues in banking supervision is if you don't need to delete it, because if you don't have it, you don't need to provide it. And that's your best insurance against data subject requests. It's data okay. minimization and with the bonus effect, of course, that also your risk of a data breach, which you know need to be notified within 72 hours to your supervisor, of course, also significantly reduces if you minimize to the strict minimum the personal data you have. Thank you interesting discussion and more a thought than a question based on Antonio's question. Uh, perhaps we need also to think about our communication with other supervisors because they may not always be aware that the data provided to us uh, may be end up at the data subject. So it's also something in expectation management, relationship management that may be needed to take into account.
having said this, I have one more colleague here uh, on my list, or the first one on my list is uh, Andreas Witte. And Andreas, if you could uh, unmute yourself, take on the camera, and then ask your question. And all the others, please, you know, there's still room on our list. You can still raise your hand. <laughs> Actually, the question would have been the same, so it has been answered okay. already. It was about the parallelism of the EU DPR and the uh, and the GDPR, and whether that parallelism should be should be maintained in the long run. But, but I think we've covered that, so so I think we're good. Thank you. Okay, then going directly to the next one is John uh, Poshia. John, uh, are you there? And if uh, then please unmute and turn on the camera and the floor. Is for you. Can you see me? Yes, we can very well. Hi. I see you. Yes. So my question would be um, for Sandrine. Um, I would I would go a bit with the court cases here. Uh, in the UPS, the court clarified that in case um, in conflict between, on the one hand. Uh, professional secrecy, on the other hand, the right of defense and the right to access the file, it is for the competent authority uh, to strike a balance between these opposing interests in light of the circumstances of the case. Um, considering that uh, the right to data protection is also a fundamental right, can the same approach be envisaged when a data subject access request would impose uh, to disclose information covered by professional secrecy? And the exceptions or restriction in the data protection framework would not be applicable. Um, I think there are two things. First, um, your question uh, is the parallelism between um, case law of the court concerning the the rights of defense and and, and in particular. Uh, as far as the the right to access the file is an expression of uh, of the rights of defense or is intended to protect the rights of defense um, first the that fundamental right the right to access the file uh, which is uh, under the heading of the rights of uh, to good administration um, in article 41 2 of the charter the professional secrecy is um, specifically identified as one of the limitations to the right to, to access the file. Um, second, concerning um, the, the idea that there could be a, a balancing exercise made by um, the, um, the controller between the interest of the data subject on the one hand to have the data and uh, the interest to continue protecting professional secrecy uh, on the other hand, I think that one of the specificities um, of the data protection uh, legislation, especially as far as the rights of data subjects are concerned, is that they do not need to demonstrate that they have an interest in their request. Uh, in a way, the right is a bit objective. And I think that, Martin, you uh, touched upon that issue. So you cannot reject a request of a data subject because you would think they don't have interest or the interest they state uh, does not exist. I think what you, what you can do is to say that you don't have the data. Uh, but that's uh, that's about it. So in a way, um, and then it's a little bit difficult to think of a balancing exercise between uh, one right where you do not have actually to um, to demonstrate an interest. And how can you balance uh, different uh, different interests? And that, I think that. In the case of data protection, the interests, so the respective interests in general, taken uh, in abstract, the the respective interests of the data subjects uh, on the one hand and uh, the guardian of professional secrecy on the other hand, um, they have been balanced by the legislator, notably in this Article 25 of the EU DPR, so the possibility 
to uh, adopt restrictions to a data subject. So that's one thing that the, so the balancing has been done by the legislation. And since the legislator imposes um, that these restrictions are led on in a legal act of general application, I think that's then again another element that distinguishes um, data protection from the exercise of the of the rights of defense. You cannot do an ad hoc assessment if uh, the only way that you can impose restrictions is by adopting a legal act of uh, general application. So I think that it would be really difficult to construe the same kind of uh, exception because because of the particularities of the of the data um, protection framework. Martin, was that with the general? Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. So, Thank you, Jeanne. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you for the discussions, for the answers. Uh, this is now the time where I give my hybrid applause to my <laughs> panelists. And I thought also to the, our audience, you stayed with us. It was a very intense session. I hope it gave you some insights, food for thought, and I hope you have now a good lunch so that uh, you bring both together, uh, mind and body. And Thank you very much. And those who will stay with us, and in particular, Caroline, also for joining us remotely, and Carolina, and for those who will stay with us, we will start at 2.30 again. Have a good break. Thank you very much. Goodbye.